Dewey Weir is. He's deceased, but he was an Adventist pastor from Australia, and he wrote several books on prophecy. And uh, he, he I, you know, there's some things I disagree with Louis Weir about, but the, the good information he has in his material outweighs um, those few things. But of the many books that he wrote, probably most people that are familiar with his books will tell you his classic was a, a book called The Certainty of the Three Angels' Message. If you, in many Adventist bookstores will have that. That's the one book that you can typically find in a regular Adventist bookstore. The other of his books are a little bit more difficult to find. If you ever come across that book, it's worth, it's worth taking a look at. And one of the book, one of the things that he accomplishes in that book is he, he identifies various prophetic, you know, rules, principles, and, uh, things that are um, not, not normally recognized right on the surface. And uh, I always try to keep that book around, and, but I always loan it out. And so m most of the time it's actually somewhere else and I don't even remember who I loaned it to. Um, so when I put these notes together, I'm in one of those time periods where I don't have that, that book and I use that book because he has a very interesting observation that's in that book. And if you turn to your notes in page 48 um, in the book where he sets this forth he uses definitions of names and I'm going to explain this to you as we go forward but I didn't have his book so I had to just take the definitions of the names uh, out of my own Bible dictionary my own Bible concordance and you know, you use different Bible dictionaries or different Bible concordances, you get a little bit of a variation on a definition of a word. So, <coughs> Louis Weir's probably did a little bit better job than what I did. Now, what am I talking about? <coughs> Here's what I'm talking about. In the middle of page 48, where you see Genesis 5, Louis Weir noted that in Genesis 5 you have the genealogy that starts with Adam and it goes down through Seth all the way to Noah. So what he did is he demonstrates that if you take the definition of each of those men's names, all right, Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahalalil, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah, and you identify the definition of those names. Do you see it on your page so you understand what I'm, what I'm saying? The definition of what those names mean is right next to him. That if you take the definitions and you construct a statement with the definition of those names that it is obvious that those names are conveying a message okay so so with the definitions of the genealogy in Genesis chapter 5 from Adam to Noah you see the definitions of the names there here's what you construct down below this paragraph Man was appointed mortal, frail, and wretched, fixed in this world, and lamenting his condition, but the blessed of God promised to descend, teaching that his death would bring, bring to the weary rest. So, in the names of those men in that genealogy, right there in the beginning, you see the gospel. That's, that's, that's a, a statement of the gospel. Do you see that? Okay, the Bible says upon the testimony of two or three things established. And you can find the same thing in Revelation chapter 5 if you take the names of the, the meanings of the tribes of the 144,000. You see them listed there. Judah, Reuben, Gad. And they're listed in the order that you find them in Revelation 7. And when you construct a statement out of those definitions... It says, God will be celebrated and praised by the 144,000 as they behold the Son of God and press together in honesty. They will wrestle with God and God will forget their sins and answer to their prayers and they will come into unity and receive the reward of the Holy Spirit living within their habitation while exalting Christ as they are added to the redeemed and set down with Christ at his right hand. That's a statement about the experience of the 144,000 that has been encoded by the Holy Spirit in their names and also within the, the sequence that their names were set for. Some people raise the question, why is it that the tribes of the 144,000 
aren't in the order from from oldest to youngest as they are laid out in the beginning and one of the arguments no doubt is because this statement that we just you know considered here would have been a little bit twisted around if you would have retained the original um, plus there, there's a couple missing we know that so um, underneath that you see Genesis 25 12 through 18 and in Genesis 25 12 through 18 it says now these are the generations of Ishmael we mentioned last time that Ishmael was the um, father of 12 sons 12 princes and uh, if any of you use the East sword um, Bible concordance th this is where these definitions come from is off of East sword and what definitions I'm speaking about is the definitions of the t names of the 12 sons of Ishmael um, and we're going to go through the definitions briefly when when I first recognize this for myself and, and you know was testing it out um, I of course knew about Louis we were applying this um, to these other places but I wasn't so interested in um, trying to apply it that way all I was interested in is when I started looking at the the meanings of their names I was just blown away that everything that we had come to understand about Islam as a subject of Bible prophecy that we were emphasizing um, was represented in their names okay so the first the first name Nebu Nebujoth I, I'm you know I don't <laughs> pronounce English correctly, let alone try to do some of these names, but it means fruitfulness. And of course, this is a component of the testimony of Islam. That was the problem, or, or of Ishmael's descendants. He would be a mighty nation. He was going to be fruitful. This is one of the biblical characteristics of Ishmael and his descendants. He would be fruitful. And you can see the, the further breakdown of that, um, of the meaning of his name. Um, and you'll see a couple biblical references there to back up that he would be fruitful. Now, Kadar means dark or dusky and uh, is identifying the, the cultural makeup of, of Islam. Dark, dusky people. I, I, I would um, put that one in there. Y and you can, read, you can read some of the comments um, about about I'm going to keep this simple. Abdil, his third son, um, means to grieve. Okay, you see that uh, the second uh, under H109, grieve or um, the grieving component. It, you can understand that that, that Ishmael's descendants not only brought grieving to others but they were also grieved because they were restrained but they also put a restraint upon Catholicism when they wrapped around Europe so this is this is one of the things that we identify typically when we're going through I Islam <laughs> the fourth <laughs> the fourth name is is Mibsam okay they, which means fragrant and and we mentioned that today and we do there, there is a an area in Saudi Arabia I think it's called the Spice Valley or it's something like that and it's that particular area where these spices are grown that are the spices that needed to be used in the sanctuary service and this is this is part of their prophetic history um, so here's a name of one of those sons that's corresponding to uh, wh what we're suggesting about the descendants of Ishmael and in the fifth is M Mishma and meaning a report and if you read the full um, definition down there that big long uh, breakdown I, I would suggest too that it's, it's talking about there's going to be a message there's going to be a report about Islam it's, there's going to be something said about the descendants of Ishmael uh, within history. The next is Duma which means silence. I mean I don't know where I learned that Duma meant silence but I've known that for a long time. I think probably 
Bibles often put that in in the marginal reference. But if you look closely, it means more specifically the silence of death. Okay, so there, the silence of death is associated with um, Islam. And uh, of course, now, now, now add in what uh, the brother said about Islam, Pat. <laughs> Okay, see death. All right, I or I can see that. Okay. Uh, now I contributed to this one. Sorry. Okay. Masa. All right. Go ahead. About the death, uh, Mark Gabriel's own book on the history of Islam as an Islamic historical scholar said their history is just rivers of blood, Muslims spilling other Muslims' blood endlessly forever, back and forth, without ever ending. So it's just a really grim culture, just from first to last. going to hold the microphone. <laughs> I'll hold it. That's right. I'll hold the microphone. We need to remember, brother, the reality of the Crusades. When we make statements of ter how terrible Muslims were, we need to remember the reality of the Crusades. And I would insist, Mark Gabriel is not a very balanced book. He, he got out of Islam with a very antagonistic, he, he today, he cannot witness to Muslims. On the other hand, there are two books that if someone is interested of having a more balanced view of Islam and a view that will contribute for us to be, to, to have missions toward Islam, there are two books. One is called Building Bridges by a um, evangelical Lebanese pastor building bridges. The other one is called um, Israel, Ishmael in the Light of Is Israel. I need to get the right title by um, Maluf. These books give a better perspective and prepare us to do mission for Muslims also. Number seven, Masa. <laughs> burden. And it, when, you, when you look down through burden, you can draw the conclusion that a burden is an oracle. It's a prophecy. It's saying that there is a prophecy connected with Ishmael's descendants or there are going to be a subject of prophecy. Hadar, number eight, means to enclose, which is what they did to the Catholic Church as they enclosed Europe, surrounded them, and prevented them um, from sweeping around the world. Tema, a son of Ishmael. And, and that's basically all you get there, but that's good enough. That's part of the story of Islam, is there a son of Ishmael. Jatur means encircled, once again enclosed, which took place in um, the history of Ishmael. But the one I like <laughs> is Nafish, which means refreshed. Mm, because what I'm understanding is that Islam is what marks when the refreshing begins, which is part of the subject that we teach. And by the way, we were teaching every one of these characteristics before anyone thought about looking at the names in such a fashion. Kadima, the, the, the president's Kadima, but when you break down the, the definition to a, to a certain level in the Hebrew, it's the children of the East. So when you look at the names, and um, and I have it, you don't have it in your notes, but I have the, the definitions, simple ones right here in a row. Islam would be a fruitful people, become one of the biggest tribes of mankind at the end of the world. They are, the, they are a dark Qadar race. Um, they are going to be restrained in prophecy. They're going to be grieved. 
Um, there is a fragrance associated with them that has to do with their connection with Israel. They are a son of Ishmael and part of their legacy of course is their connection with death whether it is uh, one way or another. Um, you know when, when you realize that the word assassin comes right out of Islamic history it's a statement about the historic reality of Islam and they are a prophecy they're in prophecy they will enclose uh, the papacy as they're used to restrain Catholicism from infecting the whole world they're from a region in Arabia um, and they are the issue in prophecy that marks the beginning of the refreshing and they are the children of the East Ishmael will be fruitful and his descendants will become a great nation of people who have dark skin. The Lord will use them to discipline his chosen people and they shall produce incense necessary for God's sanctuary. They will witness for God and be a subject of, the, of a prophecy of death. They will enclose the papacy as they encircle Europe and they will mark the arrival of the refreshing and be identified as the children of the East. I would submit to you that just as we can see this kind of statement about um, the gospel in Genesis chapter 5 and just as we can see this kind of statement through this type of prophetic study in Revelation chapter 7 that's telling us who and uh, describing the experience of the 144,000 that in the names of Ishmael's descendants we can see that those names are reflecting the role that they play in Bible prophecy which just happens to be consistent with what we have been identifying their role in Bible prophecy is and this is of course um, where many people stumble over my presentations because they think that this isn't really very good exegesis but I have a hard time seeing these things and thinking that they are just coincidences or accidents all right I think this is part of God's prophetic word speaking to us um, now uh, there, the, on page 52 you will see some breakdowns of other, other prophetic characteristics of Islam such as wilderness and desert which are, are the same words they're the desert people they come from the wilderness uh, I, uh, I won't spend time there because I'm out of time but these are clearly um, some of the characteristics associated with the descendants of Ishmael the, those characteristics that I want to point to now is they're the children of the east um, they're the desert people from Arabia uh, and the wind is also associated with them um, especially when you see that they the wild man of Genesis sixteen twelve is actually the wild Arabian ass and when the wild Arabian ass is portrayed often in scriptures it's it's emphasizing its snorting as horses do but this is consistent with the actual the purpose of the Arabian ass they go with the camels because they have the ability to smell the water through the sand they are very important okay they're they're a positive benefit when you're in the desert and you need some water that Arabian ass is going to find the the water for you but it's from their breathing that they accomplish that um, so the wind the breath is something that you will find as you look at these illustrations not only connected with Islam or Ishmael's descendants but also with the wild Arabian ass and so down here at the bottom of page 52 I went through that stuff rather quickly because I got us behind today and we want to get into Luke 21 we've mentioned this before Selected Messages book 1 page 121 says the revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs to seek this should be our first work and in the same passage seven pages later on page 128 she says a revival represents a renewal of spiritual life if my greatest need is for a revival it means that I'm dead okay when when I fall on the floor right here with a heart attack and I stop breathing what I need is someone that knows how to bring me back to life to come revive me okay I'm dead our greatest need is for a revival according to inspiration and inspiration says underneath that testimonies to ministers page 113 when we understand when we as a people understand what this book means to us and if you read the context of this passage she's talking about Daniel and Revelation even though it's this singular book but we understand what the books of Daniel and Revelation mean to us. 
there will be seen, be seen among us a great revival. We often use this principle in our presentation that, it, that at the end of the world, God's people are always portrayed as sleeping, dead, in a condition where they needed to be revived, whether it's the Laodicean condition where Christ is outside seeking entrance. Um, God's people at the end of the world needed to be, need to be brought back to life, and inspiration says the way they get brought back to life is through the prophetic word. It does not say that country living brings you back to life. It does not say that dress reform brings you back to life. It doesn't say the health message brings you back to life. What it does say is that every genuine revival must be accompanied with reform, but the reform is going to have to follow the revival because if you attempt a reform that you're a dead person, then all it is is pharisaical work. Revival has to come first, and according to inspiration, the only way revival comes is from God's prophetic word convicting you that you're dead, and if you stay in that condition, you're lost. Okay, that's, that, that's the, the way that prophecy accomplishes that. So, if you turn to Ezekiel 37, for a second testimony to that, that principle that we're dead, and we need a revival in Ezekiel 37, and we started early on that the prophets are all illustrating at the end of the world, in verse 1 it says, The hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel 37 verse 1, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me in the midst of a valley of which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were, ve were very many in, op in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord thou God, thou knowest. In a moment we're going to read some quotes where it's crystal clear. This valley of dead dry bones is the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is simply saying that the Seventh-day Adventist church at the end of the world, that its greatest need is for a revival. Okay, They're dead. Um, verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. live. When did Adam come to life? When the Lord breathed into him, right? You, they need the breath of the Lord to be brought to life. Verse 6, And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Now th this here, this is a promise that he's going to do it. Have we been promised that the Lord is going to br bring a revival to the Seventh-day Adventist church and pour his spirit out upon them and fin uh, finish the work and go home? So this is, this is Ezekiel expressing that promise for us here. So verse 7, Ezekiel's following the directions. He says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I, as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and their skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Okay, so this is, this is just the beginning. They're still, they're still not alive. Right? Where they come to a life is <laughs> the next verse, all right? Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they might live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet, an exa exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off from our parts. Therefore prophesy, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O oh my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come out of you, up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Powerful promise. But it's in agreement with what we just said, read from the spirit of prophecy. Our greatest need is to cease to be dead, dry bones and be turned into a mighty army. And Sister White says, when we understand the prophetic word, this is when it will happen. And here Ezekiel is giving us an example of presenting the prophetic word, and that's what brings the dead dry bones to life. But the prophecy that Ezekiel gives to bring them to life is the prophecy of the four winds. It says, prophecy, prophesy, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slaves, on these, this slain. Now, from Bible Training School, December 1st, 1903, Sister White says this, the dry bones need to be, I'm on page 53, 
the dry in the bones need to be breathed on by the Holy Spirit of God that they may come into action as by a resurrection from the dead. General Conference Bulletin, February 4th, 1893. I lay down my pen and lift up my soul in prayer that the Lord would breathe upon his backslidden people, which are as dry bones, that they might live. Who's, his back, who's the God's backslidden people that Ellen White is talking about? The Seventh-day Adventist Church. And she's using the terminology of Ezekiel 37 to identify that we need to come to life. Um, now, the next quote starts, Review and Herald, January 17, 1893. It says, But not only does this simile of the dry bones apply to the world, but also to those who have been blessed with great light. In the terminology of Ellen White, who is it that are those that are blessed with great light? Seventh-day Adventists. This is, this is applied um, to Seventh-day Adventists. The third paragraph, which is, has this break between it at the very bottom of the page, continuing on on this passage, she says, This class is well represented by the valley of dry bones Ezekiel saw in vision. Those who have been committed to them the treasures of truth, Seventh-day Adventists, and yet who are dead in trespass and sin need to be created anew in Christ Jesus. There is so little real vitality in the church at the present time that it takes constant labor to give men the appearance of life to the professed people of God. When the converting power of God comes upon the people, it will be made manifest by activity. This is, you know, this principle, I, I probably shouldn't go there because it's not really... <laughs> it's not really the point of the subject, but it is the point of what she's saying. Is it? There is a sense that what the Seventh-day Adventist Church needs to do, it needs to quit doing all our works. Stop doing everything that we're doing for the Lord until we're converted. Then when we're converted, the Holy Spirit will empower that work and we'll see results we've never seen before. But if I'm out there doing a wonderful work and I'm unconverted, you know, <laughs> but... What have we been told by inspiration? That at this time in earth's history, this church is unconverted. Is it not? It's a valley of dead dry bones. That's what we've been told. It's the Laodiceans. She just called us a backslidden people. So what we need to be seeking is the conversion. What the, our greatest need is for a revival. And to seek this is our second or third work. Our first work, okay. Okay, Review and Herald, November 18th, 1902. I agree. <laughs> In the hearts of many, God has a work to do if they will allow him. They need a complete transformation of character. Um, dropping down to the second paragraph from the last. These words were spoken by our instructor. Some are reckless, insensible of the revo results of sin, heedless of warnings. Soon the handwriting on the wall, now unintelligible to them, will be read, but it will then be too late for them to repent. Like Belshazzar, they seem, seem unable to seek see their peril. I'm sorry. A straight testimony must be borne to our churches and institutions to arouse the sleeping ones. When the word of the Lord is believed and obeyed, steady advancement will be made. Let us now see our great need. What's our great need? A revival. Let us now see our great, great need. The Lord cannot use us until he breathes life into the dry bones. So I hope you see that Ezekiel 37 is a prophecy about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Sister Wright is using this terminology right and left, all over the place. Signs of the Times, July 26, 1883, when the hand of the Lord was upon the prophet of Ezekiel in the vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones, he was commanded to present the 27 fundamental doctrines. Prophecy, now, brothers and sisters, what's happened in Adventism even if some are unwilling to acknowledge it. What's happened in Adventism through the years is we've taken prophecy and we've turned it into a doctrine. And prophecy isn't a doctrine. It doesn't matter where you go in Adventism today. 
if you go to an evangelistic series in Africa or India or the United States or South America, there'll be some point where the evangelist gets to, to Daniel chapter 7, and he's Daniel 2, then Daniel 7, Daniel 8, he'll skip over Daniel 11. <laughs> but when it comes to Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, he's gonna, he may have some variations on a few things he understands personally, but he's going to give the good old Adventist understanding on Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and then he'll jump into Revelation 12, maybe, Revelation 13, and then he's done. And no matter where you go in the Adventist world, you're going to hear the truth on those passages. I'm not saying they're not teaching the truth, but brothers and sisters, prophecy is not a doctrine. Prophecy is something that continues to develop and grow as you approach the end of the world. And in our Laodicean condition over the past 150 years, we forgot what the Millerites' new prophecy was. They understood it was God unfolding truth as they advanced along the pathway following the light and we've turned prophecy into a doctrine and prophecy is not a doctrine. Could you imagine if tomorrow every evangelistic series in Adventism that was going on anywhere in the world started identifying from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy who the United Nations really was, who the United States really was, who the papacy was, and what the fact that Islam is back in the prophetic issue really was, what would happen to our, our evangelistic series? brothers and sisters, suddenly we wouldn't be just doing the doctrine of Daniel 2 and 7 and 8. We'd be bringing in the newspapers that were confirming that what we were presenting is the message of what was happening here and now. And we'd turn the world upside down. Prophecy is not a doctrine. So when she says, when the hand of the Lord was upon the prophet Ezekiel in the vision of the valley of dry bone, he was commanded to prophesy to the wind and in answer to his word life was restored to the slain and they stood up before him an exceeding great army this figure was pre presented before the prophet to show him that no work of restoration could be too hard for God to do and none who trust in him need ever say as Israel has said our hope is lost next quote manuscript releases Volume 12, page 205. What power must we have from God that icy hearts, having only a legal religion, should see the better things provided for them? Christ and his righteousness. A life-giving message was needed to give life to the dry bones. Now notice the church in Battle Creek at that time and age was, the, was what we would say is the church in Tacoma Park, Maryland today. Next quote, 1888 material, 189. The church in Battle Creek is like the valley of dry bones. They need to be stirred with some power to give life. Why we have had have had to work and pray and work even to have Brother Jones obtain a hearing in Battle Creek. Who's Brother Jones? He's the messenger of the latter rain. And that's what she's saying. She said, we've had to just struggle to even get these people to listen to the latter rain message. Obtain a hearing in Battle Creek. And many of our leading men were provoked after they heard him talk to think that there were those in responsible p positions who would close the door to light and to knowledge, keeping out just what they needed. But I have not time to write more. So, once you see that, that, that Sister White is familiar with the, the message of Ezekiel 37, then when you get to this one here, in the middle of the page, and I'm going to cut in right in the middle of the first... That's, I'll just read it, the whole thing. The Lord is full of resources. This is Manuscript Releases, Volume 22, 17. He has no lack of facilities. It is because of our lack of faith, our earthliness, our cheap talk, our unbelief manifested in our conversation that dark shadows gather about us. Christ is not revealed in word and in character as the one altogether lovely and the chiefest among 10,000. When the soul is content to lift itself up to vanity, the Spirit of the Lord can do little for it. Our short-sighted vision beholds the shadow but cannot see the glory beyond. Angels are holding the four winds represented as an angry horse seeking to break loose and rush 
over the face of the whole earth, bearing des destruction and death in its path, shall we sleep on the verge of the eternal world? Shall we be dull, de dull and cold and dead? Oh, that we might have in our churches the spirit and the breath of God breathed into his people, that they might stand upon their feet and live. The message of the four winds in Ezekiel 37, 9 is the prophetic message of the four winds that brings God's people to life, that brings the revival, that produces the mighty army that, empowered by the latter rain, finishes the work that we might go home. But you'll notice on the bottom of the page, uh, Daniel 11, 45 says, But tidings out of the east and the north shall trouble him. Of course, many of you aren't familiar with the last six verses of Daniel 11. But two verses later in Daniel 12.1, Michael stands up and human probation closes. And this verse is telling about the very final movements of the papacy. And it says there's a message, tidings, that comes out of the east and the north that troubles him. And the message that's coming to him is coming from the, the messengers of that time period. And the messengers of that time period is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And part of their message is the message of the North. And the message of the North for God's people today is the message of identifying who the King of the North is in Bible prophecy. And the real King of the North is Christ. But the counterfeit King of the North is the Pope of Rome that's on his way to being returned to the throne of the earth through the power of the United States. And we are the people of the hour that are supposed to understand these things and clarify these issues for planet earth. Part of our message is the message of the King of the North. And on the bottom of this page, it says, Selected Messages, Book 2, page 102, the scenes connected with the working of the man of sin. Who's the man of sin? The Pope of Rome. The scenes connected with the working of the man of sin are the last features plainly revealed in this earth's history. I submit to you, even if you do not know what the last six verses of Daniel 11 represent, that in the next verse, in Daniel 12, 1, it says, And at that time, Michael shall stand up. And Sister White plainly tells you, if you don't know for yourself, that when Michael stands up, human probation closes. So Daniel 12 is saying, at that time, somewhere in those previous verses, human probation closes. So whatever those verses represent, it has to be the last scenes. It's the scenes that culminate with the close of probation. And Sister White says, the scenes connected with the working of the man of sin are the last features plainly revealed in this earth's history. The people ha now have a special message to give to the world, the third angel's message. Those in, in their experience have passed over the ground and acted a part in the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message are not so liable to be led into false paths are those who have not had an experimented knowledge of the people of God. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, Part of the message that enrages the papacy and brings probation to a close is the message that we proclaim identifying who and what the papacy is. And it's illustrated in the last six verses of Daniel 11, which are the events connected with the close of probation. And I quote that passage often. You've heard it many times here this weekend. And it comes out of the great controversy. On page 56, I want to put it in context for us. It says, before his crucifixion, the Savior explained to his disciples that he was to be put to death and to rise again from the tomb, and angels were present to impress his words on minds and hearts, but the disciples were looking for temporal del deliverance from the Roman yoke. They were misunderstanding prophecy, even the disciples. And they could not tolerate the thought that he in whom all their hopes centered should suffer an ignominious death. The words which they needed to remember were banished from their minds, and when the time of trial came, it found them unprepared. The death of Jesus as fully destroyed their hopes as if, they had not, as if he had not forewarned them. So in the prophecies, the future is opened before us as plainly as it was opened to the disciples by the words of Christ. Now, the pastor was talking to me before this meeting, and, and he was asking, you know, have, have I ever sat down with with leadership in the Adventist Church and dialogue about these things? And the answer is yes, more than once, <laughs> with groups of them, not just single ones, and with single ones. And it's, that's, that's something that we've done. 
But I've reached the point, and you know, I don't know that I'll do this, I usually if someone asks, I go. But I've at least thought and it's stated to people, I'm not going to have dialogue with anyone any longer in, that, in an adversarial situation, whether he's theologian or, or lay person, it's going to tell me that how I understand the last six verses of Daniel is incorrect unless he's prepared to come to the meeting and say, okay, here's a paper that explains how I understand the last six verses of Daniel 11 and you can test my position too. I'm just weary of interacting with people that say, you know, I don't know what the last six verses of Daniel 11 are, but I know you're wrong. Because I put up with a lot of that and, and tried to be very Christ-like as we did so in hopes that we would win a few. So in the prophecies, the future is open before us as plainly as it was open to the disciples by the words of Christ. So my brothers and sisters, is end time Bible prophecy been opened up to us? Has it? So there's no reason for us not to understand. We've been told it's been opened up to us. We should expect here at the end of the world when the economy is crashing and we see the new world order coming, we see all the prophetic issues taking place, it demands that the message that clarifies these things is readily available in Adventism. It has to be there. It's been opened up to us. So the question is, where is it? So in the prophecies, the future is opened up before us as plainly as it was opened to the disciples by the words of Christ. The events connected with the close of probation, the last six verses of Daniel 11, have, and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they've never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation and the time of trouble will find them unready. Every ch time we get close to understanding those last six verses, Satan's there trying to snatch that understanding away because he knows that understanding will save us. Why will it save us? If you truly understand from the prophetic word that verse 40 was fulfilled in 1989 and the next verse, verse 41, is the Sunday law in the United States, if you truly understand that, what that is telling you is that your probation is about to close here. And if you meet the close of your probation while you're holding on to sin, you're going to die. And if you understand that through the prophetic word and you determine that you don't want to die and you go to the foot of the cross and you say, Christ, I don't want to die. Please forgive me and raise me up. But you know what happens? There's a revival that takes place in your life. That's the formula for the message in Daniel or Revelation that produces the revival. That's why Sister White says our message is the most fill for warning ever given to mankind. It's the message that tells you, it looks you right in the eye and says, you either wake up to this message or you're going to die. But it also at the same time says, but Brothers and sisters, if you want to come to the foot of the cross, that Christ has all the power to take dead, dry bones and turn them into an army. All right. It's from the prophetic word that this happened. But multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they've never been revealed. And Satan's just waiting to snatch those truths away. And the next paragraph says, when God sends to men warnings so important that they are represented as proclaimed by holy angels flying in the midst of heaven. He requires every person endowed with reasoning powers to heed the message. The fearful judgment denounced against the worship of the beast in his image should lead all to diligent study of the prophecies to learn what the mark of the beast is and how they are to avoid receiving it. By the masses of people, by but the masses of the people turn away their ears from hearing the truth and are turned to fables. Boy, I can give you a list of fables in Adventism today. <sighs> in Adventism, from outside Adventism, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul declared, looking down to the last days, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That time has fully come. The multitudes do not want Bible truth because it interferes with the desires of the sinful world-loving heart and Satan supplies the deceptions which they love. But God will have a people upon the earth to maintain the Bible and the Bible alone as the standard of all doctrines and the basis of all reforms. 
the opinions of learned men, the deductions of science, the creeds or decisions of ecclesiastical councils, as numerous and discordant as are the churches which they represent, the voice of the majority. Not one nor all of these should be regarded as evidence for or against any point of religious faith. Before accounting any doctrine or precept, we should demand a plain, Thus saith the Lord in its support. Satan is constantly endeavoring to attract attention to man in the place of God. He leads people to look to bishops, to pastors, to professors of theology as their guide instead of searching the scriptures to learn their duty for themselves. Then by controlling the minds of these leaders, he can influence the multitude according to his will. The message of the North that enrages the papacy is the message of the identifying who the papacy is. That prophetic message brings revival to God's people. It brings revival to God's people. Notice this next quote. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 106. Remember, William Miller, the time of the end, knowledge was increased, right? When the book of Daniel was unsealed. But this history is going to be repeated. Notice this quote. The book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of the prophecy of Daniel which related to the last days. The scripture says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made. Time shall be no longer. The book of Daniel is now unsealed, and the revelation made to Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. By the increase of knowledge, a people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. Where have we seen God's people standing in the latter days in this presentation? How about Ezekiel 37.10? When the message comes to them, the message of the four winds, they stand on their feet, a mighty army. There's an increase of knowledge here at the end that prepares us to stand. And two paragraphs later, Sister White tells us about what the increase of knowledge is. She says, I'm th dropping down to the last paragraph, in the first angel's message, men are called upon to worship God, our creator, who made the world and all things that are, that are therein. They've paid homage. Do you know what it means to pay homage in the feudal system? It means if I'm the landowner, and you're the one that's going to work for me, that you strip naked, and you come and stand, bef kneel before me, and I put my hand on you and claim you as my own. The whole world's going to get in that condition with the man of sin in the very new future. They have paid homage to an institution of the papacy making of no effect the law of Jehovah. This is the Sunday law but there is to be an increase of knowledge on this subject. On what subject? On the king of the north and the mark of his authority. And where does the increase of knowledge come from? It comes from the last six verses of Daniel 11 because when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1989 it's telling God's people that we'll see that the next thing to happen in verse 41 is the Sunday law in the United States. And if you and I believe that's the case and we bring our life into agreement with that Sunday law testing time we become part of that army. But the majority of us are going to sleep on. That's the also the testimony now, and some people, I, I have people argue. Sister White's talking about the third angel's message here. She's talking about the third angel's message. Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is not the third angel's message. Brothers and sisters, take your concordance and look east and north and see what the Bible defines east and north as. And it defines east and north every way that Sister White describes the third angel's message. It's a sealing message. The message of Revelation 7 Come the message of the east, the ascending angel from the east that seals us. Sister White says the third angel's message is a sealing message. North represents judgment. Is the third angel's message a judgment message? Is it the message announcing Christ's second coming? Because Christ's second coming is illustrated in the east. 
Isaiah 41, east and north is Christ's righteousness. This is the third angel's message, the message of Christ's righteousness. The, without a doubt, the last six verses of Daniel 11 is Daniel's presentation of the third angel's message and people that fight against the idea that Daniel 11, 40-45 isn't the third angel's message, they don't really know what the third angel's message is. Bottom of page 57 says, Placing the Bible in their hands, he continued, You have little knowledge of this book. You know not the scriptures, nor the power of God, nor do you understand the deep importance of the message to be born to a perishing world. The time past has shown that both teachers and students know very little in regard to the awful truths which, there are, which are living issues for this time. Should the third angel's message be proclaimed in all lines to many who stand as teachers, as educators, it would not be understood by them. Hmm. Educators, if you told them what the third angel's message was, it would not be understood by them. Had you the knowledge which comes from God, your whole being would proclaim the truth of the living God to a world dead in trespasses and sins. But books and papers that contain little of present to truth are exalted, and men are becoming too wise to follow, as thus saith the Lord. This is the work that God has to given to every teacher. As educators, you have not the knowledge that comes from God. Had you this knowledge, your whole being would proclaim the truth of the living God to a world dead in trespasses and sin. You know not the message of God given for this time. You are as blind men leading the blind. Students leave the school with the false education, which is, it takes them years to unlearn. The past has shown that both teachers and students know very little in regard to the message which should be proclaimed at this time. Should the third angel's message be proclaimed in all its line to many who profess to be educated, it not, would not be understood by them. So we're plainly told in inspiration that when we get to the end of the world, those of us that are the defenders of the third angel's message, we're teaching it in our schools to our students. We don't really even know what it is. And there's another quote along that regard. Now, I'm sorry. <laughs> turn with me to, well, just turn to the next page. <coughs> You have to ask them. No. Okay. No. We, okay. we can do a very abbreviated Luke 21 and still make our points. Okay. okay. Now the reason Luke 21 is... Yeah. We, but then we would have had to do it on Friday night. They're not going to be fresh even tomorrow morning. You know, as much as we want to break this meeting right now, we're still Seventh-day Adventists, right? When we break this meeting, what we're going to do is we're going to sit around and talk intemperately late in the night. And we're going to roll out of bed in the morning just as groggy tomorrow morning as we are right now, okay? This is the, we're all in the same culture. So let, let's just move through Luke 21 very quickly. And with, with telling you out front that we have this recorded on DVDs and other places where we go through it in more detail. But in verses 5 through 7 of Luke 21, the disciples ask Jesus what the sign of the end of the world is. Okay, you can read it there right at the type of top of the page. And then you s pardon me? Okay, you'll see underneath that from the Desire of Ages where Sister White plainly says that Matthew 24 and Luke 21 is just Luke's presentation of the sermon that is recorded by Matthew in chapter 24. That Matthew 24, Luke 21, as Jesus is describing the destruction of Jerusalem to the disciples, he is also at the same time simultaneously describing the end of the world. Common, correct understanding for Seventh-day Adventists. Um, and you can see a quote if you're not familiar with that. So what Jesus is doing in Luke 21 is he's answering the disciples' questions. And when the disciples ask the question in Luke 21, what shall be the sign of your coming? Who are they asking that question for? For us. When we see a question asked in the Bible, that's a question that we're supposed to stop and say, oh, this is a question... I need to ask right now and then listen for the answer. So when will these things be and what shall be the sign when these sh things shall come to pass? 
and Jesus walks them down through the destruction of Jerusalem that's illustrating the end of the world and when he gets to verse 24 this is where we'll begin he says and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled it is unfortunate the small amount of time that we had here um, this weekend there's there's many many interesting topics we did not touch the 2520 time prophecy that's on this chart um, William Miller under this is the first time prophecy William Miller discovered and, and according to William Miller it's the time prophecy of the 2520 that led him to the time prophecy of the 2300 days and William Miller understood that these two time prophecies are connected to one another there's not there's something you, you just don't separate but William Miller also saw the other 2520 because this was the 2520 years of punishment against the southern kingdom but there's also a 2520 years of punishment against the northern kingdom so in 1856 Hiram Medson the man that received the vision of Christ moving from the holy place into the most holy place on October 23rd 1844 in 1856 he had been asked by James White to write, a, write some articles for the Review and Herald and he wrote a series of articles called the times of the Gentiles where he's dealing with verse 24 of Luke 21 and he identifies that the times of the Gentiles is this trampling down time of 2520 years that was punishment against ancient Israel for breaking the covenant and he basically says I disagree with William Miller in the sense that William Miller he saw both these time prophecies for both the northern and southern kingdom of Israel William Miller decided that the one that applied that should be emphasized and identified was the one against the southern kingdom and he marked the beginning of this punishment of Israel for breaking the covenant when Manasseh was carried away into captivity in 677 and he extended it out 2500 years and he come to 1843 but we know he was wrong because there was a mistake in some of the figures on that chart the 2520 actually comes to a conclusion there but what Hiram Medson said is he should have made the application against the northern kingdom because the northern kingdom was carried into captivity first and the northern kingdom was carried into captivity in the year 723 and when you go 2520 from 7, 723 you come to 1798 and in so doing when you're describing this trampling down that is carried out against Israel for breaking the covenant by applying it uh, this way the dead center is 538 and Hiram Edson identified 1260 years that paganism trampled down the sanctuary and the host followed by 1260 years where papalism trampled down the sanctuary and the host and there's just no way that that could be an accident from my weak human understanding but that's pretty much where it settled in Adventism until here at the end of the world when uh, people began to look at the 2520 and they realized hey they were both right you need to you need to identify both of these to really gather the light that is connected with these but in any case in any case when Hiram Edson is dealing with his article he comes to Luke 21 verse 24 and he shows you that Jerusalem was trodden down by the Gentiles and then the times of the Gentiles was fulfilled and he goes to Revelation 11 verse 2 which says but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the Gentiles shall tread down the holy city of Jerusalem for how long? For 42 months. So Hiram Edson identifies that the times of the Gentiles ends in 1798. So when Jesus is asking of the, dis asked of the disciples what's the sign of the end of the world he leads them down through history Jesus does and when he gets to verse 24 and I left off verses before that he's at 1798 then in verse 25 Jesus still answering the question Luke 21 it says and there shall be signs in the Sun and the moon and in the stars and the sign in the Sun was fulfilled May 19th 1780 the dark day the sign in the stars was fulfilled when? 1833. And on earth, distress of nations. Where was the distress of nations? This history right here. Islam's 
activity Egypt Turkey and the four powers of Europe the nations are distressed. So Jesus is, Jesus is leaving, leading the signs uh, of the Millerite history. He's taking it right down to the very you know, specific answer of their hearts. And upon the earth, verse 25, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's heart felling them for fear and looking for those things which are coming upon the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall you see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. I'm going to ask a trick question which some of you know the answer to and those of you that know the answer to don't answer. Did the Millerites see Christ come in the clouds? In this history, when these signs for the Millerites are being described for Jesus, did the Millerites see Christ come in the clouds? Yes. Yes, they did. Go to D Daniel 7, verse 13. Now we read a quote early on. It's in your notes. We read it earlier where Sister White says the prophecy of Daniel 8:14. The prophecy of Daniel 7.13. The prophecy of the messenger of the covenant in Malachi. And Matthew 25 are prophecies of the same event. Sister White says Daniel 7.13 is the same event as Daniel 8.14. You have it in your notes. It's from the great controversy. And S Daniel 7.13 is describing when Christ moves into the most holy place. And it says this. And I saw in the night visions and behold one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days as they brought him near before him. In the Millerite history, right here, Christ came with the clouds. Do you see it? The reason I'm wanting you to see it <laughs> is because we understand that this history, it's repeated to the very letter down in this history. Right? Okay? So, <coughs> further on, it says, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, verse 28, and lift up your heads, your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake unto them a parable. Now, now Jesus is going to repeat and enlarge, which is a principle that's often used in prophecy. And Jesus is the author and the voice of prophecy. And we've already noted that we have a quote from Desire of Ages where Sister White specifically points out that the dual application of repeat and enlarge is in Matthew 24 and therefore in Luke 21. So in verse 29 Jesus is going to repeat and enlarge. He's going to add a parable into the mix and he says he spake to them a parable behold the fig tree and all the trees when they now shoot forth you shall see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know you that the kingdom of God is at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all be ful fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Jesus is saying in connection with identifying the signs for this generation that the generation that sees the signs will not pass until Christ comes in the clouds of heaven. And, and we know, we've got testimony that this was true. The Millerites that witnessed and responded to these signs in this history, that generation lived until Christ came in the clouds of heaven. Did it not? Uh, yeah, prophetically, prophetically. It's a type of him coming in the clouds at the end of the world. So, if you go and you have quotes that I've passed over, like if you notice on page 61, if you think that I'm putting my own interpretation on what the distress of nations was in the Millerite history, you'll see a quote there um, by Uriah Smith. Some other quotes. I'm passing over those quotes um, because of time. But go to, go to page 62. We're not done with the parable. We're just about ready to start the parable. I want to add one more th thought into the mix. Sister White plainly teaches that when Jesus is giving this sermon that's recorded in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, that Jesus is describing the destruction of Jerusalem to what? To illustrate the end of the world, right? If you understand that, say amen. Okay. So in Desire of Ages 632, 
It says, at the close of the great papal persecution, Christ declared the sun should be dark and the moon should not give her light. Next, the stars should fall from heaven. And he says, learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that he is near even at the doors. Christ has given signs of his coming. He declares that we may know when he is near even at the door. He says of those who see these signs, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. These signs have appeared. No, now we know of a surety that the Lord's coming is at hand. Heaven and earth shall pass away, he says, but my word shall not pass away. In describing the destruction of Jerusalem from Review and Herald, December 7th, 1897, she says this. The scenes that were transaction, transacted at the destruction of Jerusalem will be repeated at the great and terrible day of the Lord, but in a more fearful manner. A world is represented in the destruction of Jerusalem, and the warning gives them gives then comes sounding down along the line to our time. The warning given then comes sounding down along the line to our time. And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth the stress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Yes, the sea shall pass its borders and de destruction will be in its pass. It will engulf ships that sail upon its broad waters and with the burden of their living freight, these will be hurled into eternity. There will be, you know, one of the most, most powerful prophecy schools that we ever had was in Germany. And the reason it was powerful is maybe it wasn't anything else than just our human, our frail human condition. Is the prophecy school started the day after the tsunami hit. Ooh, boy, did that put an emphasis on the end of the world. But you know what? We don't even think about that anymore, do we? I mean, how many people died like that and ships went down like that? I mean, there's so many signs occurring right now that we're confronted with them and a week later we forget them. There will be calamities by land and sea, men's heart felling them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming up on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall you see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power. Next quote. This is the one I was looking for. I'm sorry. I'm getting weary. The Great Controversy, page 29. Signs and wonders appeared. Now she's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which illustrates the end of the world. Signs and wonders appeared, foreboding disaster and doom. In the midst of the night, an unnatural light shone over the temple and the altar. Upon the clouds at sun set were pictured chariots of men of war gathering for battle. For seven years, the man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring, declaring what? Declaring the seals. No. Declaring the, the churches. Declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. By day and by night he chanted the wild dirge. A voice from where? A, a voice from where? Ah, the message of the east. A voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds. A voice against Jerusalem and against the temple, a voice against the bridegroom and the bride, the voice against the whole people. This strange vision being was imprisoned and scourged with no complaint, but no complaint escaped his lips. To insult and abuse he answered only, Woe, woe to Jerusalem, woe, woe to the inhabitants thereof. His warning Christ ceased not until he was slain in the siege that he had foretold. The woe message was carried to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem and its destruction illustrates the end of the world. So now let's look at the parable. We've read it already, over page 63, almost done here. Parable sa the parable says, Behold the trees and all the trees. It be, behold the fig tree and all the trees. On the top of page 63, under the trees, Sister White says, Mark the cursing of the fig tree representing the Jewish nation, covered with leaves of profession, but no fruit to be there found thereon. The curse is pronounced upon the fig tree, which represents the moral thinking living agent cursed of God, living as it were, at living as were the Jews for 40 years after this event, yet dead. Mark the other trees representing the Gentiles were not covered. They were leafless, making no pretension to having a knowledge of God. The time of fruit leaving, their time of fruit leaving was not yet. The leaves represent profession, but the distinction between the fig trees and the other trees is the, the church and those people outside the church. Behold, the church and those outside the church 
but there comes a time when the trees begin to sprout out. We'll deal with that in a moment. Jesus places this parable in the summer. He says, you know of your own self, when these trees begin to bud out, that it is summertime. And Jeremiah 8.20 says, the harvest is past, the summer is ended. So when the summer ends, what has passed? The harvest. Matthew 13.39 tells us the harvest is at the end of the world. So the parable is identifying the harvest at the end of the world. It's not emphasizing the Millerite history. It's emphasizing the harvest at the end of the world. Okay? He pointed us to the budding leaves of spring. Why? Because that was our sign. Our sign. Millerite sign following the star's dark day. Distress of nation. Our sign is when the trees begin to bud out. Okay? Notice what Sister White says in Great Controversy 308. Christ had bidden his people to watch for the signs of his, signs of his advent and rejoice as they should behold the tokens of their coming queen, king. <laughs> when these things begin to come to pass, he said, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. He pointed his followers to the budding trees of spring and said, when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is nigh, now nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, you know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Brothers and sisters, let's keep it short and simple. What is it that causes the trees in the Middle East to bud out in the springtime? It's the latter rain. The sign for the 144,000 isn't the falling of the stars. It's not the dark day. The sign for the 144,000 that they must recognize is the latter rain. We have to see the latter rain. Turn real quick, and I, I won't let myself get carried away, but turn real quick to Zechariah <laughs> chapter 10. Verse 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. Ask ye of the Lord rain. 10.1. Ask ye of the Lord rain. In the time of the latter rain. Brothers and sisters, how can I ask for rain in the time of the latter rain except I know that I'm in the time of the latter rain. We have to know that we're in the time of the latter rain. In fact, we don't simply have to know it. It's our sign. It's our sign. Brothers and sisters, the way that we know that we're in the time of the latter rain is because all these lines of prophecy, what they are illustrating is the time period of the latter rain. All these reform movements are prefiguring the final reform movement of the 144,000. And when you get specific with these reform movements, the ones that inspiration more often than not points us to as a point of reference, it's the time of Christ, the history of the Millerites, and the history of the 144,000. And we've read several times in here where Sister White compares this history when the mighty angel of Revelation descends, which is the beginning of the sprinkling of the latter rain. She compares this history with Pentecost. Is Pentecost an illustration of the latter rain? And she compares it with the history of 1840 to 1844. Is this an illustration of the latter rain? Oh yes it is, brothers and sisters. Therefore, the way that we tell that the latter rain has begun is by recognizing that these histories that prefigure the history of the latter rain are now being fulfilled. Therefore, the sign that Seventh-day Adventists have to recognize one way to express it is that up on September 11th 2001 
Islam began to fulfill its prophetic role in the third woe. Hmm. And the mighty angel of Revelation 18 come down. And you know what that means? One of the things that means, and we're proving this from the biblical testimony. This isn't a general statement like we hear in Adventism sometimes. The Bible is proving that the people that see this, this generation does not pass until the Lord comes in the clouds. We are the final generation. And our sign is September 11th, 2001. And if there is ever a prophetic truth that Satan wishes for us not to understand, it's this one. This is the message of the four winds. And the message of the four winds of Revelation 7 is the message of the sealing that comes from the east. And the message of the east is the message of the children of the east that mark the beginning of the refreshing. There is no more serious prophetic understanding that has ever been identified in sacred history or ever will be again. This is the sign that God's people must respond to if they're going to allow the Lord to breathe into them and bring them to life. And this is also a sign that tells us that this is the final generation. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we ask that you would continue to pour your Holy Spirit out upon us here in the time of the latter rain. Awaken us to where we are in earth's history and who we are in earth's history. And give us the courage and the faith to bring our life into agreement with what you were telling us at this time that you might bring us to life. Amen. Lord, we have family members that aren't understanding these things, that aren't prepared to meet you. We have church family members that appear to be in the same condition. And we have neighbors whose blood we are going to be held accountable for. And we have a whole world to warn. We ask that you would empower us. But we know that the empowerment will only come if we meet the requirements called upon by you in the gospel. That we come to the foot of the cross. Meet the conditions of the gospel. And allow you to raise us up justified and sanctified. Convict us that this is our need at this time. And then put a burden on our heart to test the things that we've been hearing this weekend. For if these things are true, Lord, we understand that we must know these for a certainty. But if these things are false, we know that you would only bless the study and the time it would take for us to come to this understanding through our personal study. But Father, remind us, if these things are true, the, the most foolish wicked thing that we could do is to not test this message with your word and the spirit of prophecy and see if it was so. Help us to be among those that understand the increase of knowledge and pass through this testing process in a way that would glorify you to this world we ask in Jesus name and we ask for a good night's rest that we might come back refreshed and finish off this um, weekend experience tomorrow in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. So uh, it's getting kind of late. So, but we'll go ahead and take a few questions. If anybody has a, can I, can I have a thought? Yes. Do you want to do tomorrow? Yeah, I want. I want to say this. That, you know, 
it's this is the type of a prophecy school in which uh, the idea of questions and answers is always good. But Sister White House Counsel, I mean, uh, I'm pretty much a teacher. I'm not much of a preacher. That's about wh what I shared last time is about as close as I get to to trying to you know point out our personal need in, in relationship to this message. And Sister White points out that when we have messages such as this, sometimes it's better just to quietly finish the meeting and go to our own little sphere of influence and let the Holy Spirit continue to speak to our hearts about what we've just heard. And sometimes question and answer period destroy that whole atmosphere. So I think we should take her counsel. <laughs> Um, so then let's do that. Let's go ahead and finish. It's late. And uh, let's just get ready for tomorrow's meeting. Uh, um, right after breakfast. Breakfast is at 8.30. And uh, the first meeting is going to be very interesting. So let's at 9 o'clock. No, sorry, 9.30. 9.30. All right. So see you back here at 9.30 tomorrow. <laughs>